the church here has uh, assigned me the uh, task of teaching about appointing elders, and it's a thing that we desire to do, and we'll be looking for uh, nominations, I guess, in June, so that we can begin that process of appointing. And since, uh, or really, that task includes, or in my case especially, is to teach about it, <laughs> so we're trying to teach about it and uh, look at the things that the scriptures contains about elders. To this point, we have talked about things that are somewhat, I would say, elementary things, uh, straightforward teachings about uh, the qualities that you're looking for in elders in the New Testament, 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 especially, in which we can see that their qualities are just <coughs> basically faithfulness. Uh, they do have to be fathers and they do have to be husbands um, and they do have to be experienced in the faith. But really, that's kind of that's kind of about where that part of it ends in terms of your basic qualities. You're just looking for men who are faithful husbands and fathers, faithful Christians who are husbands and fathers, who have done right in uh, raising their children, who have done right towards their wives, and uh, are in the the Lord's favor. They're they're in favor with God. Uh, if anybody you know is lacking those qualities that you read about there, um, that's something that needs to be dealt with. And maybe thinking about elders makes you think about those things and realize there's some things here that need to be dealt with, elder or no, <laughs> uh, which is okay. Uh, if the exercise helps, then let it help. But, you know, if anybody here is not the hus is, is a husband of more than one wife, well, we need to do something about that. That's not acceptable. If anybody here does not restrain his children, that's something we need to do something about. That's not acceptable in the Lord. If anybody here is given to wine, if anybody here is given to fighting, uh, is violent, is rude, proud, boastful, yeah, none of that is acceptable, whether that person is trying to be an elder or not. There's nothing in those lists that is over and above what you and I are required to do as Christians, really. Uh, other than, as we said, he has to be a father, he has to be a husband. Okay. You don't have to have children to be right with God. You don't have to be, get married to be right with God. I understand that. But the basic principle stands. Nonetheless, we started then to look in Titus 1 in the later verses, after those basic qualities, to realize that he has to have the maturity to teach. Well, he has to have the, the dedication to God's word as an absolute and an objective standard. That's Titus 1, verse 9, so that he can do two things. First, he is to encourage the saints with his own healthful teaching, and also, in parallel, he is to rebuke those who contradict the sound teaching of God. So he's got a, a, two, um, a dual purpose there, and that begins to speak of something that is a little bit higher, if you will. That means that this person has a command of the Scriptures, and it's not going to be pushed over by every wind of doctrine. It's going to hold fast to the word. It's, it's going to be objective uh, with the scriptures. Not so much, if you will, dedicated to us or this church or this place as he is to God's word and insisting that we <laughs> in this church, in this place, perform what God has in his word for us. That's his job. Now we look at some other things that are part of the work of a shepherd. You see in the New Testament interchangeable terms, shepherd, elder, and overseer. Uh, Acts 20 is a great example. 1 Peter 5 is another example where you see all three words used in proximity. These are the elders of the church of Ephesus. I think that's verse 23 of Acts 20. That he has summoned and he tells them, the Holy Spirit made you overseers, shepherd the church of God. So the elder, the overseer, the shepherd. These are all the same person. But today we're talking about shepherds. Shepherds care for the church of God. And care, uh, the care and keeping of a shepherd is, as we began to show in Titus 1.9, is 
a double-edged sword. The, the shepherd does have a crook on the, on the staff, which is the nice, gentle way of grabbing you and pulling you back. But the other end of that staff is pointy and sharp, which can be a goad if you are stubborn. But it is primarily a defense mechanism when the wolf comes. It's probably his only weapon when he may well be on his own with a flock and a wolf comes. And wolves are, are serious. I, that's quite a large animal. So um, we have to begin to see that there is a dual purpose here. The shepherds, the elders are to be shepherds, which is a responsibility, you know, a care for them. Both care with your heart about them genuinely, but also care in the sense of attend to, uh, be attentive, be dedicated to this thing. So in Acts 20 and verse 28, when Paul says to them, care for the church of God, that care for is shepherd, not shepherd them. It says this church uh, was obtained with his own blood. And that, of course, brings it right down, fairly simply, God paid for it with his own blood, the blood of his son. What's it worth to you? And that's a valid question for all of us, elder or no. <laughs> What's it worth to you? He paid for it with the blood of his son. How do you treat it? Is it important to you? Is it worthwhile to you? Does it deserve respect? Does it re deserve love? Uh, benefit of the doubt? Kindness? Charity? But especially for the elders, the shepherds, they have to understand this is the thing. This is an important thing, a valuable thing, the issues of life. So on shepherds, I'll say this. Um, you see shepherds in the prophets. Throughout all the prophets, you see the shepherds of Israel who are the elders of Israel, the leaders of the people. Jesus himself is the good shepherd who excels the shepherding that went before him by those who were in power when he came to earth. And Peter calls Jesus the chief shepherd in 1 Peter 5. Even though Peter himself, as an individual, was called to be a shepherd, and many other individuals are called to be shepherds through Jesus. So, uh, there's a lot of things here, and we can't possibly get to them all this morning, but... Uh, Let's get through some of these things. I want to take a look in the overview here at the idea that the shepherd must be a selfless person. The shepherd has to be selfless. And uh, by this, I don't mean that he is a glutton for punishment and you can just treat him however you want to. <laughs> Let's not do that. That would be of no benefit to us. Um, let them do this work with joy and not with groaning. But they must be selfless. John 21 is where Jesus and Peter have a difficult conversation because Peter, well, forsook the Lord. He betrayed the Lord. Uh, he denied having known the Lord three times over before his crucifixion, did not stand with him to defend him in the fake trial he was being given. I don't say it to run Peter down, I'm just saying that's what happened. We would all probably have been very scared in that situation, especially if you know what it means to be crucified. It's, it's a genuine mortal terror to be crucified. That is, people are scared. They're running scared. So, we're not running Peter down, but we're saying that's what he did. And it wasn't excused. It's not okay. And it wouldn't be okay for you and me to do it either. But, after the resurrection, the other one who betrayed Jesus, Judas, was dead. Because he went and hanged himself. Because he was swallowed in sorrow. He had worldly sorrow that produced only grief. Peter had godly sorrow that produced repentance. And so Peter 
has this conversation with Jesus. And it's kind of between the lines here, I understand, but, but we can talk about it more if you need more detail. There's more than one word for love in the original language. And there is a love that is kind of an acquaintance or a friend kind of love. Uh, and there is a love that is a sacrificial love, the love that a parent has for their child or somebody who is a soldier who gives their life for the cause. It's that kind of sacrificial love, selfless love. So they're using these two different words. When Jesus first says to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? You love me more than you love these. He's saying to him, do you have a sacrificial love for me? Which is implying, are you ready now to stand up and pay a price? Where before you were not ready to do that when you denied me. That's what this is actually about. And that's why it happens in triplicate. Because it happened in triplicate before. So he says, Simon, you love me. You have sacrificial love for me more than these. He said, yes, Lord, you know I have a friendship love for you. So what Peter is saying to him is, you know that I didn't come through. I let you down. That's what he's saying. So now Jesus says to him, feed my lambs. <laughs> so you've got work to do, basically. You have work to do. There's something here that needs attention, which is feed my lambs. Second time, Simon, do you have sacrificial love for me? Yes, Lord, I have friendship love for you, as you know. So still sticking, we haven't moved. We haven't moved. And Jesus said, shepherd my sheep. We have lambs who are being fed. We now have sheep who are being shepherded. And what we're getting at is Peter has to come to take on that self-sacrificial stance if he is going to be a shepherd. And he is. So he said to him third time, Simon, do you have friendship love for me? As in, is that all you have? That's really what's being said, okay? Is that all you got, Peter? You really only have, you're not willing to sacrifice? And Peter was grieved because he said the third time, do you have only, sac or only friendship love, not sacrificial love? Not because he said it three times and Peter was impatient, but because Jesus moved. The negotiation didn't move, Jesus moved. And that's very distressing. Is that all you got, Peter? And Jesus said, do you love me? Only friendship love me? He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I only friendship love you. But Peter doesn't think he's ready. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. I tell you truly, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. When you are old, you'll stretch out your hands. Another will dress you and carry you where you don't want to go. Which he said to show by what kind of death Peter was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. But that 18th verse is very telling, isn't it? Not just the fact that he will, in fact, die for the cause, which might have happened to him if he had stood up for Jesus instead of letting the rooster crow. <laughs> he will, in fact, die for the cause. But don't you see what it's saying? You have to be willing to sacrifice yourself. You have to be willing to pour yourself out on the service of, what did he say? Feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. When you were younger, you did what you wanted. Now you're going to serve. Let's see, the elders, the shepherds are servant leaders. They're leaders, yes, and we are subject to them. But do not be deceived. It is service. It is sacrifice. It is hard work. People will mistreat you and malign you and say nasty things about you. They always do. That's not, a, that's not an if, that's a when. So 
Jesus told him how he was going to be and said, follow me. But Jesus, of course, laid down his life for the sheep. We know that. He suffered much mistreatment and much malignment. Right? So to say, follow me, it's follow after him. Jesus calling Peter to come into this place of self-sacrifice. The elder has to be selfless. And then Peter, later, will write to us about that office in chapter 5 of his first letter. I exhort the elders among you, a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ too. See that reference back to John 21? He saw what happened to Jesus. That's what this is. As well as a partaker in the glory going to be revealed. You shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. Let me point out in the second verse, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, that is not about the sheep who sometimes do have to be compelled. That's about you as an elder. <laughs> you are serving willingly, not because you're compelled to serve, pressed into service. Yeah, sometimes the sheep have to be compelled. There is a pointy end on that stick, and you sometimes have to goad people. But you don't do it with a domineering. Prove to be examples to the flock. We'll look at um, the prophets with regard to domineering, and that'll bring some clarity to this. And the benefit is, when the chief shepherd appears, you receive the unfading crown of glory. Jesus is the chief shepherd. He set the example of self-sacrifice, the example of accepting mistreatment against himself and malignment. True. But he also put himself between us and harm. He interposed his precious blood. So yeah, the shepherd has to be selfless. Okay, that's the first thing. What we're being called to do, if, if you are uh, being called to shepherd, what you're being called to do is to be a servant of God whose job it is to tend and care for and feed the sheep in the local congregation, even at personal risk and personal cost, sacrifice. Okay, that, And you say, that doesn't sound like it's good. Well, I, I'm just trying to be truthful with you about the fact that it is work and it is hard. That's all. It is good, though. There are many benefits. And now let's go to the prophet's. And I'll take you to Jeremiah 3. Look at the benefit of having a good set of elders in a place. Jeremiah 3, at verse 12, the prophet is sent to say this, Return, faithless Israel, declares the Lord. I will not look on you in anger, for I am merciful, declares the Lord. I will not be angry forever, only acknowledge your guilt that you rebelled against the Lord your God and scattered your favors among foreigners under every green tree. That's idolatry. That you have not obeyed my voice, declares the Lord. Return, faithless children, declares the Lord, because I am your master. I will take you, one from a city, two from a family, and bring you back to Zion. I will give you shepherds after my own heart, who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. That is the benefit of a good set of shepherds. He said, we, the people, must return to God in the heart, admitting that we were wrong and that God is right, and on our restoration to him, we have this benefit of shepherds after his own heart. How do they feed? They feed with knowledge and understanding. When Jesus said to Peter, tend my sheep, feed my lambs, this is what he meant. It's the work of the elders to ensure that there is knowledge and there is understanding in the church. People need to know the scriptures. They need to know the Lord. 
And there has to be an understanding, understanding how to live, how to make choices, how to resolve problems, issues, differences. Elders shepherd us in these ways. They show us the things we need to do, which they can do, you know, if we refer back to our old or to our previous lessons, which they can do from their experiences. They've brought up children and corrected them too. They have seen some things in life and they can bring some experiences to the table. And um, as we mentioned um, in one of the earlier lessons, they're always in a plurality. You find somebody who is a faithful Christian, who is a faithful husband, a faithful father, who has uh, Christian children, having brought them up and taught them right, and you can see the fruit of that because their children obey. How are you going to find a better or more likely candidate for somebody who can get it right <laughs> when there's a dispute, when there's a problem? Right? You're not going to find a more likely person to get this right. And if you put two, three, four of those people together, and they respect God, and they respect the scriptures, and they call each other to account, that's our best shot at getting the answer. That's the best way for us to resolve things, right? So God gives shepherds after his own heart, which is very similar, and I'll call your mind back to Acts 20, verse 28, where he says, the Holy Spirit made you overseers. Well, these people were actually, if you will, not to argue with Paul, but just for a moment, they were actually appointed by Timothy. 1 Timothy 3 is where he was told how to appoint them at Ephesus. But earlier in Acts 20, after Paul left there, you know, and he wrote 1 Timothy and sent him the instructions for how to appoint them, then later, when they had been appointed, he could bring them to himself at my, uh, he called them, to himself at Miletus. And this is the conversation in Acts 20, 28. He's talking to the elders <laughs> at Ephesus that were appointed according to the instructions of 1 Timothy 3. And he said, the Holy Spirit made you into overseers. Well, I thought it was Timothy. Well, no, it wasn't Timothy. Timothy was just doing what Paul wrote. Oh, so it was Paul. No, it wasn't Paul. He just said what the Holy Spirit told him to say. The Holy Spirit made them overseers. Right? That is how it works. That's how it always works, authority from God's word. That is how you have shepherds after his own heart. If you appoint them according to the instructions of the Bible, then you're getting what, you know, if you're doing what God said to do, you're getting what God wants you to have. That's how it works. So those are, you know, those are the benefits of having good shepherds. I have to think about this. <laughs> let's do uh, let's do this one. If you turn over to Jude, yes, let's do it this way. We'll look at Jude. We'll look at Ezekiel thirty-four, and we'll call that done. There are such a thing as evil elders. There are shepherds who should not be shepherds. There are elders who should not be elders. That exists. Um, and again, you know, if, if you're of a mind to think, well, you know, uh, we, you know we, we, we don't have anybody, you know, we don't have enough people to appoint elders, therefore we just won't have elders. Well, you're wrong. Um, if you don't have enough faithful men to appoint elders, then every man here is an unfaithful elder because they're the ones who are making the decisions in the business meeting. Like it or not, that's the truth. The truth is I currently am an unqualified elder. I'm one of the men who makes the decisions for the church here, for you. I do the best that I can. I'm honest and trying, but I'm not a duly appointed elder even though 
Maybe I qualify to be appointed as an elder. I don't know that my name has come up. I'm not trying to put my name up. I'm saying, what about the 18-year-old who's a part of the business meeting? What about the single person who is a part of the business meeting? Should they be leading the congregation? Should they be making decisions? Well, they are. They are. Like it or not. There's no choice to have, you know, have faithful elders or have no elders. That's not the choice. You're going to be led by somebody. You are being led by somebody right now, today. It's either duly appointed faithful elders or it's a bunch of unqualified elders. However you slice it, that's the only two choices that there really are. So yes, there are such a thing as evil elders, and we need to avoid that, and, we, and there are things put in place to prevent those things. But do not think that, you know, it's just as well to have no elders. No, that's pretty equivalent to having evil elders. It's pretty close. Now Jude 12, he said, these are hidden reefs at your love feasts. Actually, it says love. They supplied the word feast. I don't know where they get that from. That's not in the text. As they feast with you without fear, shepherds feeding only themselves. So, a hidden reef. Well, what's a hidden reef? Well, this is a danger under the surface of the water. You can't see it, but if you're on the boat and you're going that direction, it looks like you're going on the water, but no, there's something under the surface there that will wreck you. That's what it's like to have an evil shepherd. It looks good, but there's something under the surface. And when you come to that point, when you get to that problem that that shepherd has, there's going to be a wreck, a very serious problem. They feast with you without fear, shepherds feeding only themselves. Uh, this has got to be the spiritual feast, the fellowship in the Lord, the, the Lord's Supper, something along these lines metaphorical but shepherds feeding themselves it's literally shepherding themselves because the job of the shepherd is to feed and to care they're taking care of only themselves now here I would ask you is it shocking right I mean is it shocking that Jude would be talking about the elders well no it shouldn't be shocking remember what Paul said in Acts chapter 20 I warn you from your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples among among or the, to draw away the disciples after themselves. He warned them that this would come to pass, but he still appointed elders, right? He knew that some of them were going to do wrong, but he still appointed them. Not that he knew they were unqualified and put them in anyway, but no, he knew that there was going to be people who would not use this office the way they're supposed to use it. True, but that doesn't mean you throw the office out. And Jude said, you need to do something about these shepherds. Contend for the faith. Don't roll over. You know, it seems like the faithful are too sheepish. <laughs> you kind of roll over and like they're willing to let things go. You know, give up. Give up the building. Give up the treasury. Give up everything. You know, and walk away. Ah, uh, no, I don't think you should do that. I think you should fight. They're the ones who are wrong. Make them leave. This is God's place. This is God's people. Get with the program or get out. I think you should stand up and fight. But not just me. Ezekiel 34. Jude clearly has Ezekiel 34 in mind. And this is lengthy, but let's do it. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy. Say to them. Notice, prophesying in the, in the old way was kind of like our preaching today. 1 Timothy 5 tells you the evangelist is charged with rebuking elders that sin. He appoints them. He rebukes them too. He's required to do that. Uh, so it is here. There are shepherds, but there is also somebody who is 100% totally dedicated to the word itself, a prophet, 
and he rebukes the shepherds. Thus says the Lord God, Ah, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves, shouldn't shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with their wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you don't feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought. With force and harshness you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And they became food for all wild beasts. My sheep were scattered. They wandered over all mountains on every high hill. My sheep were scattered over all the face of the earth, with none to search or seek for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord, as I live, declares the Lord God, surely, because my sheep have become prey, my sheep have become food for wild beasts, since there was no shepherd, and because my shepherds have not searched for my sheep, but rather the shepherds have fed themselves and not fed my sheep. Therefore, you shepherds, you hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my sheep at their hand and put a stop to their feeding of the sheep. God removes them. No longer will the shepherds feed themselves. I will rescue my sheep from their mouths that they may not be food for them. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out as a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered. So will I seek out my sheep. I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. And in the 15th verse, I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord, and I will seek the lost. I will bring back the strayed. I will bind up the injured. I will strengthen the weak and the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them in justice. 31st verse said, You are my sheep, human sheep of my pasture. I am your God, declares the Lord God. All right, lengthy passage, as we said. But clearly, what Jude had in mind. These are shepherds feeding only themselves among the people. Shepherds who have been feeding yourselves, shouldn't they feed the sheep? Well, we look back at verse 4 and see the list that is there. It's a pretty good way of thinking about the work that elders are supposed to do. The condemnation of these shepherds is the weak you have not strengthened. What does that mean for elders? Well, the elders are charged with strengthening the weak. If somebody does not know the Bible like they should, the elders should be especially careful to make sure that one is protected, that that one is getting the teaching that is necessary. The sick you have not healed. Are they making sure that the attention is paid, the medicine is brought, the cure for whatever spiritual illness there is, afflicting some member of the congregation? is actually there for them. That's being applied. They go to that person and study with them or talk to them or pray with them or all of these. The injured you've not bound up or bandaged, you know. Again, when somebody is afflicted or harmed by error or sin or some troubling doctrine, the elders are to provide the scaffolding that that person needs, the protection that that person needs. What are the forms that this takes? Well, it takes a lot of... We'll, we'll get to this. It takes a lot of forms. And I think especially the latter half of this verse, Ezekiel 34, 4. The strayed you have not brought back. The lost you have not sought. It is the work of the elders to bring back those who are straying. When people are falling away from God, when their, their dedication is not evident, when their faithfulness is coming into question, that is a time for the elders to go to that one and see how do we help? How do we support? Come back to the faith that you once loved. Is anyone seeking the lost? And 
with force and harshness you've ruled them. He said that, and that I think is the explanation for First Peter five. There is such a thing as force and harshness in ruling. That's not what you're looking for. But notice when the congregation does not have a mechanism, i.e., elders who strengthen the weak, who would heal the sick, if the congregation does not heal the sick, if the congregation does not bind up the injured, if the congregation does not bring back the strayed or look for the lost, then the sheep will be scattered. And that is the same as having no shepherd. The shepherds were there, but he said the sheep are scattered because there's no shepherd, meaning there's no real shepherd. Nobody here is actually taking ownership, standing up for the truth and for God and for the souls of men, the lives that hang in the balance. No, nobody's taking it seriously. That's what he means by this. And this is why 34.10, he says, I will require my sheep at their hand. This is what, this is what uh, Peter, I'm sorry, what Paul was saying in Acts 20. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to the flock, to the church, among which God has made you elders or overseers. I'm going to get this one to you. Here we go. It's Acts 20, beginning at 25. He tells them, I'm leaving. I won't be here. I testify to you, I'm innocent of the blood of everybody. Would you like to be innocent of everybody's blood? You can be, but you have to do it in a specific way, which is, I'm innocent of the blood of all because, Acts 20, verse 27, I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. See, he wasn't afraid. Everything that God had to say, he said it. That's why you elders must pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God which he obtained with his own blood. Because I know after my departure fierce wolves will come in among you not sparing the flock from the outside and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. This is why he said at 28, pay careful attention to yourselves. Care for the church of God. The price of it was his own blood. Because fierce wolves are going to come in from outside. You have to do something about those wolves, elders. And... Fierce wolves are going to come in from inside too. You have to do something about those wolves, elders and preachers. Be alert. 31 of Acts 20. Remember, for the three years that I was with you in Ephesus, I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. Constantly warning people. He's constant, night and day, doing the work. What's the, uh, what's the answer? Well, the answer is Acts 20, verse 32. Now, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. The answer is God's word. We lean on God now. Paul's going to be gone, and uh, he tells them, and certainly has been gone for millennia from our perspective, but his words are still here through the Spirit. We are commended to God and to the word of his grace. And it tells us plainly in Acts 20, verse 32, that that word, the word of God, is able. People think, oh, the Bible, well, I mean, we've had a Bible. Yeah, but are you demanding it? Are you standing for it? Do you require it? Do you see what's on the line here? This is people's lives. That is able to build you and give you the inheritance among everyone sanctified. See, the, that's what he's getting at. Or 
Remember, Peter did the same thing. 2 Peter 1.15, I'll make every effort that after my death, you will be able to recall these things. And that is 2 Peter 3.1. Both of these letters stir up your mind by way of reminder. This is the means by which he is intending to make it possible for us to call this to mind. It's the word. Do you know Moses did the same thing? He wrote everything, everything down. Deuteronomy 31, 24 begins. And he commanded the Levites, take that book and set it next to the ark to be a witness because I know how rebellious and stubborn you are. Today, while I'm still alive, you've been rebellious. How much more after I die? That's harsh, but true. Fair, fair, right? Assemble to me, Deuteronomy 31, 28, the elders and officers, because I know after my death, you will surely act corruptly and turn aside from the way I've commanded. And in the days to come, evil will befall you because you do evil, provoking God to anger through the work of your own hands. But it's just very clear. This pattern has been around forever. Which is, shepherds must take on the mantle of responsibility. And I'll leave you with that, because that's the conclusion here. <laughs> The shepherds have to take on the mantle of responsibility. You know, the fact is that, that the Lord gave us apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers, Ephesians 4.11, right? The apostles are gone. The prophets have ceased. Evangelists are still here. Yes, we, do. we are. And then shepherds and teachers too. And we're very blessed to have good teachers. But see, the apostles are gone. The prophets are gone. What are you going to do? It's down to you. Take on that mantle of responsibility. Somebody has to be the people of God. Somebody has to lead. Somebody has to stand up for God's word. Shouldn't you? And if not, why not? And if you won't do it, how long will God let you stick around? Why? Remember all of the things that Jesus said? <laughs> Pull that one up. Why does it take up the ground? Remember that? That's harsh, but true. Why does it take up the ground? Pull it up. And he said, wait, I'll put a hedge around it. Give it another year. If it doesn't bear fruit, then we'll tear it down. How many more seasons do we need? I remember, um, I'll talk about this for just a moment, if you don't mind. Or I guess even if you do mind, I don't know. Uh, I'm still going to talk about it. The, uh, the elders, are, uh, there was a place, a faithful place, as I thought it, uh, where there was an evangelist, a very good, very sound evangelist of many years. Um, really good faithful man, knew the scriptures, stood strong against error and against false teachers, and preached in no, in no mean city, you know, no, no simple easy post uh, in, in a place in, in where, where there were lots of false teachers around, lots of false brethren around, and lots of controversy, but he was faithful, he was stalwart, he stood and stood and stood. Um, what I noticed, though, was that Despite that, and despite their uh, congregation being, I don't know, 60 some odd people, they didn't have elders. And he died. He died in office. So then they didn't have elders, and they didn't have an evangelist either. Um, and what you saw happen after that, and I don't say this to run them down, I say this as a warning for us, what you saw happen after that was it sure looked like nobody knew how to do anything. Like that guy, that evangelist, he was the one who did everything. Nobody else seemed to know anything about the Bible or how to stand for the truth. That's what it felt like. They didn't seem to know how, how, do, you, 
how do you decide what is faithful, what is right? Who should be allowed to place membership here? Who should we bring to hold the gospel meetings? Who should we have as, as an evangelist? How do you go about choosing an evangelist? They didn't know how to do anything. Well, who's going to teach the class now? Right, all this stuff. And you realize, because I thought to myself at the time, man, I really thought that brother was sound and faithful. But look, I mean, and he had been in that place for many years. But what you saw was he departed, just like Moses, just like Paul, just like Peter. He departed. And after he left, who took on the mantle? You know, we're not supposed to be in this model of having a hero that goes out before us to fight our battles for us. That's not what's supposed to happen. And you look at it and you see it and you realize, man, what a, what a tragedy that befell this place. Not so much that that brother died. Because you know what? Death happens, man. <laughs> Everybody, nobody has a, a lease on life. Although you could be, you could not, you wouldn't be faulted for thinking he did. I think he'd been struck by lightning twice before that. <laughs> Literally struck by lightning twice. One of them during when he was in the pulpit. Uh, I don't think he finished that lesson, but he still preached after that. Um, but truly, uh, you looked at it and you thought, well now, what is this? Uh, I thought this church was faithful because they had this guy here who clearly was. But then, when you give them, when you entrust them with something they have to do, they're not trustworthy. The product is not there. The outcome is not there. So, are they faithful? I don't know. That's where I was at. I said, I don't know. Is this good? Is this right? I mean, this is clearly not good. This is not right. But why is it like this? Was it his fault? Did he not do a good enough job of teaching? Did he not show them the way? That, did he not warn them? No, I know better than that. I know he did. Did they not hear it? Well, they did. Did they listen? Did they, did they agree with it? Of course they agreed with it. That's why they were there. There were lots of other churches to choose from. So how come they didn't know how to do any of it? That's what we're getting at with the elders here, the shepherds. You have to care. You have to care. You have to take it personally and do it. And take on the mantle. Well, that's, that's the lesson about shepherds. <laughs> There's more in the prophets, and we'll get to them, I think, at an appropriate time. But at this time, we will pause and talk about things that make for salvation. I mean, the whole point of the elders is that the church should be what it ought to be, that it should be a place where people can come who need spiritual healing, who need spiritual uh, uh, correction, who need to start over in life and grow and be uh, scaffolded, protected, you know, supplemented, encouraged, have somebody who's watching so that when things go wrong, somebody steps in. Hey, how do I help you here, friend? That's, is that the choice you meant to make? I don't think it is, right? Somebody who's kind and able. That's the point. That the church be some place where God would send people who need to obey the gospel, who need to grow, who need to learn, who need to be corrected. That's what we're aiming for, is to be that place. Because that's what pleases God. That's the organization that pleases Him. All right. Today, if you're not a Christian, become a Christian, because we are the children of God. We love God. We love His Word. That this is a safe space for God and for faith. <laughs> if you believe in God, if you believe in the truth, if you believe in the Bible, you're among friends here. If you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, repent of sins, start over in life that you might be buried together with him in baptism, putting to death the old person of sin, and become a Christian, being buried in baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sins, and his blood washes away every sin, and you become a new creature in Christ Jesus, created in him for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So you're going to live faithfully from there. You're starting your journey. You're going to grow. We're going to help each other. 
You help us, we'll help you. Today, are you perhaps already a Christian, but have not lived right, walked in the things that God prepared beforehand for us to walk in? Well, repent. Pray God for forgiveness. As the prophet said, only admit your guilt and come back and be shepherded by his word. If we can help you to restore you to the faith, be glad to pray for you and with you. We all need prayers. If we can help you to become a Christian, a child of God, we are ready to help you be baptized in his name. If you let your need in the spirit be known at this time by coming to the front while we stand and sing. <laughs>